Well, if you would, turn in your Bible to our foundational text as we're in this series entitled CPR. CPR, you know what that means, creating personal revival. Breathing new life back into yourself. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 5 is our foundational text. Notice here the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Isn't it amazing? I told you how sometimes God will set you in a low place to show you some things about yourself. And then he caused me to pass by all around, and behold, there were very many in the valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? You ever been in a situation and you wondered, is there any hope? And so I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Let me tell you this, nothing is done in the kingdom of God until something is said. You got to prophesy the dead stuff in your life. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. These are various ways I'm sharing with you something that God shared with me in the middle of the night about how to create personal revival. If you live long enough on the earth, you're going to go through some dry spells in your walk with God. And, and you're going to need to know how do I get my fire back? How do I get my zeal back, my passion back? How do I get it back? Because you would have been enthusiastic at one time and then you can grow cold and you'll need to have a renewal in creating personal revival back into your own heart. And I've given you key number one is to go back and rediscover your purpose. Go back and rediscover your purpose. Whenever you are moving in line with your purpose for the very reason with which God birthed you into the world, something comes alive in you. You don't come alive until you are moving and operating in your purpose. And you've got to learn how to turn your pain into purpose. Uh, life is so much richer with meaning and purpose. And, and so we have to live a life that is on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. The second thing is to revisit your passions. Revisit your passions. Go back to the things that you were passionate about. Sometimes you can get so busy trying to do stuff to make a living that you walk away from your passion. You can get so wrapped up in meeting the expectations of other people of you that you have left your first love. And you got to go back to the stuff that God put into your heart as a passion. And when you go back, come back and, and connect and revisit your passion, there is something that comes alive in you once again. That's key number two. Number three is to reevaluate the people in your life. Reevaluate the people in your life. You can often tell whether you're with the right person or, or not by what happens in your life. If you start getting worse after a certain person has entered your life, all insecure and on lockdown and edgy and I mean it, it's, it's a clear sign that this is not a God ordained relationship. Have you ever seen people when they get a certain person in their life they get worse and children start hanging around a certain kind of person and they become more rude, more impatient and all kinds of things happen so you can tell the direction in which you're moving by what's happening in your life based on the people who are there. So you have to reevaluate the people in your life. You show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's very interesting. Here's a, the, the fourth principle is to re-examine the problems in your life. Re-examine the problems in your life. Because there's nothing like a problem that'll drive you back to your knees. That'll bring you back into a closer relationship with God. You know, it's sometimes not until we have a problem that we turn our plate down and start fasting. You, uh, problems have a great way of getting you back spiritual with where you need to be with God. And sometimes if things have been going hunky-dory for you too long and too well, and you can sort of think that, hey, I got this, and, and you can drift away from God, resting in your own autonomy and self-sufficiency. And God never designed for us to be independent of him. He always designed us to be dependent on him. 
So you have to re-examine the problems in your life, and you'll find that that can reconnect you to your passion, to your a revival of God's Spirit in your life. And then here's principle number five, if we come to number five this week. It is to recommit to prayer in your life. Recommit to prayer in your life. Recommit to prayer that's in your life. I want you to clearly understand that you notice when God said to prophesy to the bones, that this prophetic power comes out of your prayer life. It really does. And when God begins to send breath to prophesy, pneuma, spirit, breath, we have to be able to take breath, pneuma, spirit, and put it with the logos, the written word. And when pneuma, the breath of God, is added to the logos, the written word of God, you get rhema. It's the spoken word of God. It is God's word that becomes activated into this world. And when you begin to prophesy, guess what happens? A wind comes out of your mouth. Just like when God speaks, there's a wind that blows out of his mouth. Uh, it, it stirs something in the atmosphere. That's why God said that, that my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it, and it shall accomplish that which I please. God's word has power, and it will begin to change things. Here, here's some winds that will happen. Because we're talking about creating personal revival. When the wind of God begins to blow, the first wind of God that will blow is called the winds of holiness. Winds of holiness. Where the Spirit of God will come and God's Spirit alone will convict men. Do you know that it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin? That's not the ministry of men. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. His job is to convict the world of sin. There is one sin that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of. It is the sin of rejecting Jesus as Lord. And that the Holy Spirit will bring conviction in the hearts of mankind and draw them to the bleeding side of Calvary so that they accept Jesus as Lord. There comes a strong wind of holiness. If you ever get in a ministry and the holiness leaves out of that place, I would wonder, very careful, I'd want to get away from that because I wonder, is God in this thing? It is God's presence in anything that makes it holy. If God is not in the Bible, it's not a holy Bible. If God is not in your marriage, it's not a holy marriage. It is God alone who makes things holy. God alone makes holy. So he sends a wind of holiness. The second wind that he sends is a wind of harmony, a wind of harmony. When the Spirit of God comes, your twisted, divided soul, your schizophrenic self comes into harmony. Prejudice begins to dissipate. The differences that exist between mankind, people that don't look like you, that don't sound like you, that don't think like you, God makes it when there's a oneness in the Spirit, because there's only one Spirit, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. That's really just one blood. We've all come from the same Lord. We ought to have the same Father. God begins to send winds of harmony, winds of harmony. It's not about black and white and Latino and Asian. It's about the humanity of who we are, that through Jesus Christ we are brothers and sisters baptized into one body by winds of harmony. And people stop all of the things that separate us in terms of language and culture and levels of education and the amounts of money that we have. And we respect things because God has come with winds of harmony to erase the lines that divide. God begins to tear down walls, and instead of building walls, he builds bridges. And God connects that which was disjunct and disconnected by his own power. So he sends winds of holiness, secondly, winds of harmony, and thirdly, winds of harvest. There comes a harvest in the economy of God. It comes by His own Holy Spirit, where He brings a harvest of souls that comes as a result of the power of prayer. It really does. John Bunyan said this, that he who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find Him the rest of the day. You ought to learn to make time for God first thing in the morning. 
It's one of the f most honorable things that you can do is to put God first and honor Him. I mean, when your eyes open up, you ought to think of God's thought, Lord, thank you for grace for another day. Thank you that this day that your mercies are made new to me. Thank you! Something ought to bubble up. First thing in the morning when you open your eyes, you shouldn't start running down this list of what all you need to do today and the fact that you're running late and all that. You ought to say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. God, I thank you. Make it a part of your daily journey every single day, every single day. Have you ever just taken time? Because when we're talking about creating personal revival, this, this whole idea of recommitting to prayer in your life, Prayer is about a quiet time where you settle down and you stop the busyness of life that can get you away from God. It is the strategy of the devil to get us so busy on our feet that we don't have time to get on our knees. Have you ever just taken the time to just get quiet? Have you ever awakened in the night and, and you begin to hear all of the weird sounds that are happening in your house, the floor creaking, things in the ceiling shifting. You know, because temperature changes cause things to move. In the nighttime, you, you, if, you can, if you can hear it, if, if, if your room is near the kitchen, you'll actually hear the motor turning off and on on your refrigerator freezer. Now let me tell you this. The floor creaks during the daytime, so does the ceiling. And the motor goes off and on on your refrigerator, freezer, during the daytime, but we don't hear it because we're too busy. And it's not until you get quiet in the night that you can hear stuff that goes totally unnoticed by the noise and the busyness of the day. And I cannot tell you how many things that we miss because we are oversaturated with stimuli during the daytime to even notice. When was the last time that you sat quietly and just listened to what was going on in the world around you? When was the last time that you were in receive mode instead of transmit mode to just be quiet? When was the last time that you just sat there, not trying to figure something out, not trying to exercise, not doing anything on the computer, not on your cell phone, not eating a snack, not even listening to music. When was the last time that you just sat and had a time of quiet reflection, a pensive mood before God? Because you know, coming events, they send very soft and subtle signals, but we are seldom quiet enough to hear them. Now let me say this to you. It is better for you to carve out quiet time that is short but regular instead of lengthy but random. I'm going to say that to you again. It is better for you to carve out quiet time that is short but regular instead of lengthy but random. When was the last time that you were just in receive mode? Well, you could go outside in nature and watch a bumblebee do its thing or a butterfly land gently on the leaf. A time where you don't think, you just look, you see, you feel, you smell, you listen. What makes you think that you always have to be doing something? Remember that we are human beings, not human doings. Human beings, not human doings. And some people get their greatest insights when they're in the shower. You know why? Because a shower is a routine activity for us. It puts your mind on autopilot because when you shower, you're washing the same body parts in the same order. So you don't even have to think about it. You go on autopilot and then the water of the shower creates, as it were, white noise. 
that actually allows your soul to simply reflect. And some of the greatest thoughts come to people while they're taking their shower. Anybody ever had that experience where it's just a time and, and you realize that some things are happening? It's because it's routine and your spirit gets an opportunity at that time to just shut off from the rest of the world. And you're on autopilot because you do the same thing in the same order every day, hopefully every day. Did you know that even watching too much television can become deleterious to you? It can create deleterious effects on us. It can make a person lethargic. Watching TV too much, you can become lethargic. You can become non-communicative by watching television too much. You can become insensitive and you can become sleepy just by watching too much television. But let me say this to you, that if for nothing else, we need prayer to maintain patience and to be able to hold on to our peace. If for nothing else, you need prayer in terms of creating personal revival, you need prayer for your own personal patience and for your peace. You need prayer for, for peace, just, just to bring peace into your own soul with the insanity of somebody that might be in your house as a nuisance to you. Just keep looking straight ahead. We definitely need prayer for revival, personal or otherwise. And there are three keys to revival. Number one, prayer. I hope you can remember all three of these. Number two, prayer. <laughs> Number three, prayer. They're the three keys to revival. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Because prayer is the lifeline of the believer. Prayer will get us in, prayer will get us through, and prayer will get us out. If you're in a bad situation, prayer can get you out of it. If you're in a pickle and you, you don't know whether you can make it through this thing, prayer can get you through. If you're in trouble, if you're in hot water, prayer, prayer, prayer can, can help you. It can help you. If you're in a situation where you're out of a job, prayer can get you in. I'm just telling you, you got to learn to pray. It's prayer time. It's prayer time. Can I prophesy to you for just a moment? Stop focusing on your giant. Focus on what the giant is trying to keep you from. Every time there's a giant that shows up in your life, the giant is there to keep you out of something that's greater than what the giant is himself. The giant is a distraction. The giant is an obstacle that you've got to overcome to get to where God has already destined you. There was a throne waiting on David, and a giant was in his way. So you better look beyond the giant and see what is it that this giant is trying to stand in the way of God doing in my life. And let me just tell you this. Can I prophesy something else? If God puts a Goliath in your path, it means one thing and one thing only. It means that God has given you a giant killing anointing. If God put a Goliath in your path, it means that he alone has given you a giant killing anointing. That means you've got power to be able to deal with this thing that is a giant that's looking like it's coming to stop you from God's purpose. It means that there's already an anointing in you. And you don't feel like you have much. You may not have anything but a sling and a rock, but that's all you need. That is all you need. It's all you need is a sling and a rock. And do you know that you have to learn how to use what you got to get what you want? I love something that John Bunyan said. John said, prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Prayer 
Terror is a powerful thing. No wonder Charles Spurgeon said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. You know why? Because the devil is never intimidated by prayerless preaching nor prayerless teaching. He is not intimidated by prayerless witnessing to somebody because your witness does not have power unless you prayed. He's not intimidated by prayerless churches. You can have all the church you want as long as you don't have a praying church. A.T. Pearson said that there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Prayer is an incredible secret to revival in your own soul. And you can tell what the devil is really against by what he fights. The three top ways that Satan fights prayer are number one, sleepiness. Anybody ever been there? It's time to pray and you just you're like your eyelids get so heavy. Sleepiness, sleepiness. Beware of rigid formulas. Beware of rigid formulas. I mean to overcome sleepiness. So you have to change up your sequence. And if the devil is trying to put you to sleep on your knees, stand up. You won't fall asleep standing up. And if you do get tempted to fall asleep standing up, walk around instead of staying in one place. Pray on the move. You have to have tactics to counter him. When you know his tactics, you know how to plan your counterattack. Here's the second thing that he uses, wandering thoughts. Wandering thoughts. You ever get ready to pray and in your mind just start figuring out what and where you're going to eat and what's coming on TV and what all you have to do and your mind, you're, you're just, you're not even there with God. Your, your mind is wandering thoughts. It's a satanic distraction. If your mind is wandering, put on worship music. Lift up your hands while you're praying. Have an actual list of things that you want to make sure that you include during your time of prayer. You have to have counterattacks for the devil. And the third thing that he uses are interruptions. Have you ever been on your knees and, and, uh, or just in a place sitting on the side of your bed in your bathroom praying? And then somebody start calling your name, Mama! <laughs> the moment you get in prayer, somebody's going to call your name, the doorbell ring, your cell phone goes off. You ever notice that? Just interruption, just interruption. It didn't even happen until you, were, you started praying. So he uses sleepiness and wandering thoughts and interruptions. And so you have to be aware of his tactics. So you have to choose a time of day that works best for you where you'll experience the least distractions and where you'll be most focused. You know, uh, first thing in the morning is not always the best time for some people because some folks are not morning prayer, uh, morning people. Some folks work all night and they're just getting home in the morning. They need to go to bed. They're not going to be very effective. They need to wait until they have an alert time. And so, uh, th th the different tactics that you use when the devil is trying to come against you. If you've got a problem even being able to be disciplined in praying by yourself, then find somebody to pray with. Because shared encouragement is always a motivation to you. Get a prayer partner, an accountability person for your prayer life. And please understand this, prayer is not talking to the wall. It is not talking to the wall. When we pray, we are talking to somebody. When we pray, we are communicating with a real person, a real God, a real Holy Spirit. We're talking to somebody who hears us and who understands us. God feels the joy and the excitement and the sorrow and the pain that we have at that moment when we pray. And He knows that there are times when we don't even know what to say, and that's okay. He's God. We are permitted to just rest in Him and do what I call pray without words. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.